And hello, everyone. Welcome to another Gretel Workshop today on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Uh, my name is Mason. I'm the lead developer advocate here at Gretel. And joining me today is a real treat. We have our chief product officer and co-founder, Alex Watson. Hey, Mason. Uh, How are you doing? Hey, doing well. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about a project that is I'm really excited about. Um, it's my one of my favorite parts about the Gretel SDK right now, and I really like. I keep really close eye on the development of it, which is called Gretel Trainer. Um, if you've ever used Gretel before, you may have seen our SDK, which uh, has is is a good way to interact with our API. But we were like, we can make this simpler. Um, and I know Alex always takes simplicity as a challenge. Like, like you've I've heard you use the quote before: if you can do it in four lines, do it in three. If you can do it in three, do it in two. So. Uh, I definitely think we we took the approach, or Alex and his team took the approach to let's simplify tr Gretel, and where we can generate synthetic data, and we now have Gretel Trainer. So, anything you want to add about that? No, I think that's a really good summary, right? So, um, I think a lot of our users are pretty familiar with the uh, the Gretel uh, uh, client SDK. That's what we have in most of our Blueprint notebooks. So, if you're looking at the open source examples from Gretel, we have this like production, highly scalable uh, Python SDK. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed and we always strive for is is adding simplicity and this idea that like every time that we like make it a one step simpler, we really open up the aperture for like different use cases that our users and developers and things like that can go after. And um, one of the, you know, the things I think is so exciting about what we've done with Trainer so far, and maybe I'll start with just giving a little bit of context on Trainer. Um, I use an analogy for those like machine learning folks out there. I think of Trainer as being a lot like what Keras is for TensorFlow where under the hood, you have this incredibly power machine learning, powerful machine learning library it can do anything, but sometimes there's a lot of complexity to get started. So when I think about trainer and, you know, when I use trainer in my own projects, it's when I'm trying to do something really quickly. Um, there's two goals that we have with the trainer SDK uh, that we're going to be walking through today. Um, one is Mason called out simplicity. How do we go from, you know, 15 lines of code to generate synthetic data, which was, you know, incredible a year ago down to five lines of code, down to three lines of code. And so really, I would view what you see in Trainer as a preview and experimentation for what's coming into our production SDKs over time. It enables kind of fast experimentation and feedback and for us to learn for how users want to build things. And the second thing that's pretty cool too is we also use Trainer to preview some functionality that's going to be coming to our service. Um, so we can talk about this uh, you know, as we go through the examples, but. Uh, Trainer has some incredibly powerful concepts built into it uh, that are coming to our production service. Uh, for example, the ability to process data sets um, that have, let's say, hundreds of thousands of columns. And that sounds insanely big, uh, but really it was taking the learnings that we've had working on genomic data uh, with companies like Illumina, for example, where you have these massively highly dimensional data sets and saying, how do we train a synthetic model that can be created? Trainer has that built in. So what was in our original case study with uh, the Illumina folks, you know, three or four notebooks full of steps that you would use to process data. It's now four lines of code that's required uh, to do this with Trainer. So very exciting. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I'm super excited. I definitely like the the quickness of it. I feel like I can get a lot done uh, really quickly, and I can just you know, I don't I don't get bogged down trying to figure out synthetic data. I just make gener synthetic data and I keep go keep on my merry way, which I think is definitely, you know, the accelerating piece that we're always aiming for. So the first thing we're going to do is let's just go ahead and get the base, show you how basic trainer is and how, how simply you can get something going. So what we're first going to do is we're going to import trainer from our library. We've already pre-installed the library because nobody wants to watch me pip install on screen. Um, we have this data set that we use. Uh, it's the US adult income 5k data set. Um, it's a pretty standard data set in the uh, machine learning data science space. It's a good one. And it really does kind of highlight some of the um, some of the functions that we can do here with Trainer. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a model. So we do trainer.trainer. .trainer. We're just creating a class of it. And as you can see, we have all of these uh, options that are here. But what we're going to start with is we're going to do project name. And we're going to just call this one. We're going to just call it Trainer. All right, that's not a that's the default. That's a bad name for it. Let's call it uh, Workshop since this is our Gretel Workshop. If you don't give it a name, it defaults. It calls it Trainer. So if I had done project name was Trainer, we would have it would have been completely pointless. We wouldn't have got anywhere with it. Uh, and then the next thing we do is we basically tell it, "Hey, train on this data set. So train a synthetic data model on this data set." Which like this is the fact that it's just that. Like, hey, train the data set. Love it. 
Um, and then we say model.generate, and then we can say the number of records here is equal to 100. And then we just go ahead and hit play. Oh, I made a boo-boo. <laughs> this is what happens whenever I, sometimes the pip install is mean to me. There we go. Okay. I might've had something in my cache. Who knows? Google collab. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is it's going to ask us for our Gretel API key. So whenever you're using Google collab or some sort of system that uh, basically is using, like you're using a web-based notebook or something where you don't have access to a command line interface, you can just input your key here. Uh, we will go over later how to do a configure on your command line if you are doing this locally, say with maybe con a conda environment. So we're just going to go here to API key. It is also on the front page, but I like going to the API key just to be certain. I grab it, we hit enter, and then we go. And it's, as you can see, it logged in as me. And now we are training a model. Now, the cool thing about this is, is that we can either watch this from here or we can come back to the dashboard and we can watch the progress of our synthetic data model. Uh, come on. There we go. Had to have, have it, have, had to have it catch up with me. And we can come and watch all of our logs here from the dashboard. So if, you, if you're also using the dashboard or you want a, a nicer UI for watching as your model trains, you can totally come here and watch it. Mason, maybe we'll walk through as it's, uh, it's, it's picking up a worker here, walk through exactly what's happening under the hood with Trainer as we go through. Fantastic. Uh, if you mind going back to the code, maybe I'll, I'll talk about some of the steps that's happening behind the scenes that you absolutely have the ability to influence should you want to. Um, right. But Trainer makes a lot of these decisions for you. So in that top line, what we're doing is we're instantiating a, a Trainer object. Um, this Trainer object has the ability to interact with any of the different models that Gretel supports. So um, kind of a cool thing here is, you know, there's not one model to rule them all in the Gretel world. There's some models that work really well for text data. There's some that work really well for tabular data, ones that work when you're trying to generate billions of records. Um, the trainer object here, what it's doing is it actually um, on the model.train, it takes a look at the data sets. It looks at the dimensions of this US adult income data set. It says, what do I know about this data set? It's 50,000 rows and, you know, 20 columns. So it takes a look at the data and then makes a decision automatically for you, like what is the optimal model to run here, trying to find that, that perfect balance of accuracy and for some, uh, some, some customers as well, uh, privacy. So that's happening. And really the task here um, when it's training is the, uh, the model, the, uh, the deep learning model, generative model we have under the hood is examining this data set and it's learning to recreate the data set. So a model completion means that this model has um, learned how to create another data set that has the same insights. If you were to query it, we'll give you very similar responses, um, but without actually replicating any of the real data. So this like synthetic model or synthetic data that's generated um, has the same look and feel as the original data, um, but it's not based on any real world people, objects, things, or things like that. Awesome. Yeah. So how, how do you... What are, what are some of the things you look at whenever you're trying to figure out what, what model? So I, you said like something like, is it like number of columns, the amount, like, is it text versus numerical data? What are, what are some of the, the default or like the, the most important things to look for when you, whenever trainer decides what is the best model to use? Yeah, that's a, it's always a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> it has something to do with your use case and also the types of data you're sending through. Um, I, I believe here you can see, um, as you see this model selection here, you can see what model it picked. So here, synthetics is the default label that we have for a, a language model. Uh, it's based on an LSTM that's running under the hood. Um, what we found are language models. So uh, a lot of people are familiar with uh, um, like sequence-based models, uh, transformers, things like that. These uh, 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 models that are really great at, at learning and recreating human language. Turns out they're also really great at learning and recreating uh, like structured or tabular data. So that's what's happening under the hood. Um, language models aren't as fast as some of the, uh, the other alternative um, deep learning generative models like uh, diffusion models or GANs, um, but they have the ability to learn patterns, complex patterns, such as like natural language text um, and create data sets that have really great accuracy. So I think, you know, um, describing what happened here, it took a look at the data set and said, this data set's not too big. 
Um, there aren't too many columns in it, um, which makes it an ideal candidate for, uh, for a training language model, which would take a little bit longer, but is excellent at learning the different patterns and data. So we'll see that. Um, we'll get a look at the quality score when it's done. Um, but I would expect that the, uh, the quality score for this configuration that it's picked here is, is really nice. So the benefit here is it's abstracting some of that like decision process where you have to say like, hey, what, what model, you know, go to Gretel docs.gretel.ai site and look at the models and figure out which is the best for you to run. Um, we believe most of our users like don't need to worry about that and we can um, abstract away a lot of that complexity. That's really useful because yeah, like I, th I think that, you know, whenever you want to get started, especially with a new tool, you like, it's fun to read the docs, but it's all, it's more fun when the tool just works out of box and you don't have to spend a lot of time figuring it out. So I would, I guess that would say like, if you're new to using Gretel and you're new to using trainer, let, let trainer figure it out first. If it doesn't work, then you can, or you can always just go, you can, then you can go and fine tune it, but let it, let, let, let trainer give it its best shot first. And then we can figure out, you know, from there. And I, I've also, yeah, I've, I've trained this data set enough times to know that it does a very good job of selecting and it usually comes out really well. Um, as we can see here, we can see, oh yeah, we definitely get a little bit more data here in the. You get a lot more data when you're looking at the console, right? The trainer uh, output is very simple. So, you know, what's happened here, uh, where it says uh, creating synthetic model is we are using the Gretel cloud to train this model. So it's not happening on your collab environment or on your own workstation in this case. Um, it's using the Gretel cloud. It's spun up a container with access to a GPU and it's using that to train the model. You have the ability um, to, uh, to choose to, to run models locally. Um, we're just taking advantage of the cloud here. So uh, infrastructure setup is not something you have to worry about. Um, and then each step here, um, each epoch is essentially a pass, a complete pass over the original data. And we see things, and this gets very complicated very fast, but things going down here, like the goal is to increase accuracy. So you wanna see this accurate data account move up and you wanna see the loss move down. Um, it looks like it's generating data right now, if I'm able to read that kind of small print. So it's, it's finished training the model, it's generated a sample data set and it's generating a quality report for us automatically right now. Yes, looks like it's creating this synthetic data quality report, model creation complete. Uh, I think eventually I know it will spit out the, okay, okay, right here. So we have an SQS score of 92, which is excellent. Which is that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's really while it's great. finishing up generation here, uh, Mason. Maybe you go back and, and show everyone a preview of what the other uh, report looks like. Yeah, I do love the report. Also, hands out to like having a copy button on your logs. As someone who's had to debug stuff before, being able to copy the whole logs is definitely uh, valuable. So yes, here is our the preview of our synthetic data quality report. But if you want the full version, you usually download this and then open it up and we get our synthetic data quality report, which always has such goodies. I love the expandability here. Do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, just the high level of this? I know we could spend hours digging in. Absolutely, this. and yeah. I, it's probably another workshop for us to do, I think would be a, a good time for it. But really this zero through 100 score is, is so useful for saying like, is my model doing good enough? And here we can see it's doing excellent. So we really don't have too much to worry about. It looks like the trainer picked a good set of parameters. Um, yeah, I always uh, you know, kind of go through and. Um, you know, the first thing you want to look at is the number of training lines duplicated and just make sure that your synthetic model didn't actually copy over any of the original data. Um, that shouldn't be possible with uh, the, the default privacy settings that we have. So this is all new data being created. Um, if you want to go through and, and scroll through there, you can always kind of geek out and look at some of the fun distributions and things like that to really give you that sense of, of comfort. But we're in a good spot. Um, Trainer did its job. We've got a, a nice synthetic model and, and sample data set to work with. So we're ready for whatever's next. Yeah, love it. So now we go back here and we have our synthetic data set. So we've created a hundred rows of synthetic data and I was like clicking on this little magic button because it makes life a lot easier to read. Um, yeah, so now we have synthetic data. We have our basically the US adult 5K income and it looks very much like our other data. I wish we had done a, let's let's do something real quick. Where's the, actually no, cause it's the same. Mm, we can do this. Let's copy this. Let's do a code box. And then what we'll do is we'll pull you up and we'll preview the original data. So we can kind of do like a comparison and see like, hey, this is, well, no, you can't go above PIP. Uh, cool. And then I have that code over here somewhere. So yeah, let's just do this. Do that, delete that. 
Oh, I have to import pandas. Pandas as PD. I didn't pip install pandas. Of course I didn't. There we go. Run that again. If you hit stop, like I'm clicking too fast. I'm trying to do it quickly. I'm getting excited. And I double clicked and then it went away. I'm sorry. Hey, uh, Mason, I think we might have the, uh, the variable that incorrect. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I found it. There we go. OK, so this is the original data set. I'm also going to take off my Apple Watch because it's going to start talking to me. Um, so as you can see, the original data set, age, private, high school, grad, married. Civic. So like this is just kind of the data we can expect to see. And if we look at our generated data, if you had to put them side by side next to each other, I wouldn't be able to tell you the difference. Like they look, they look almost identical. Is there anything you want to point out here, uh, Alex? No, um, I think this is this is one. So maybe talking about the use cases we would see for, you know, why would I create a synthetic version of this data set? Um, often privacy is a really big deal. So you have, a, you know, here we're looking at something that's obviously like very sensitive. Um, um, you might have um, demographics or, you know, individual um, employees or things like that that this income data is based on. I need to create another version that I can use for machine learning model training or add to my data warehouse or things like that, that actually don't point back to real people in my business. So that's one big use case. Um, the second big use case we see is um, um, boosting the representation of, of certain classes in the data. And this is really to help you train models that, that work better on the types of data that the model will encounter in the real world. So if you might have, for example, a uh, a new type of data coming into your model or a, like a, a class imbalance where you've got very few examples of like high school graduates that are, um, you know, uh, living in uh, a certain state in Ohio, for example. Um, you could use conditional data generation, which I, I believe we're going to uh, go through next, right, yep. Mason? Yep. So essentially telling the model to generate more records that look like this and having it autocomplete the rest is, a, is another big, big piece of functionality. Yeah, that's that's actually something that I was playing around with this week. I finally got around to it, and I really enjoy conditional data generation. It feels magical, almost to be honest. Like, <laughs> so um, actually, let's rerun this one. So as we can see, we have we have a whole bunch of columns here to choose from. One of the ones that I, whenever I was doing my playing around this week, I decided I was like, hey, let show me high school graduates that were never married that are making over fifty k, and then show me. Batch people who have their bachelor's degree who are never married who are making under 50k. So that's the kind of data that I chose. Let's generate some data that looks like that. So what we have to do is we have to first create our seed fields. So Alex, do you can you explain what is the like what is happens when we apply a seed field to a synthetic model? Like how does that work? Like does what does the model do with this data? So we are telling our model, and the kind of cool thing here, this works across all the different models we support. Um, so this idea of conditional data generation is that we give the model a little bit of information. For example, here, I want to see a certain education level or marital status and have the model complete the rest of it. Um, by predefining these seed fields like what we're doing here, we can really optimize the model to do a good job at this task. So here by saying like, hey, these are the fields that we, we think we might want to use for conditional data generation. Essentially, we architect the, the model training data in a way that it's going to be really great at completing the rest of the data. So we've defined three different fields here. And what we can do after we've trained the model and want to generate more data is by specifying exactly what each one of these fields should, should contain. Um, we can do that with the data frame, or we can do it with CSV. We can have the model essentially auto-complete the rest of the data for us. Cool. OK. That's, I, I love that. That's a, I love that example. Sometimes I just ask questions because I want to know the answers. And I hope that other people are getting value out of them too. So what we do next is we, we supply the seed fields as a parameter here. And then what I am going to do just to be a little bit, to allow us to not have to always retrain the model if we want to play around with this a little bit, is we're going to add, we're actually going to do the generate in a different box. So we're not going to generate from the, from the, I did that wrong, my bad. This parameter goes in the train, not the trainer thing. This is why you have notes on the, on your other screen. Always have notes, people. It definitely helps. And you can't have an extra comma there because, yeah. Okay, so we have, that's all good. So all we're going to do is we're going to seed field on education, marital status, and income bracket. So let's go ahead and train the model. As you can see, my credentials were already cached, so we don't have to keep uh, re-inputting it. 
Um, and then I actually did, while, while Alex was talking, I did change the project to workshop conditional. So we are going to have a different model here in the dashboard and we can watch what's going on here once it gets to a certain point. Okay, it looks like it's already going. So we should be able to see what's going on. Cool. Okay, so now we're just waiting on it to train. Uh, ooh, what questions do we have? What did we want to talk about? <laughs> I could jump on and talk about maybe some of the differences in conditional data generation between different models. Yeah, go right ahead. So what we see happening right here, just for a quick update, anyone looking at the screen here, um, uh, we've started training a model. Um, and what that means is we've kicked off this process in the Gradle Cloud. What it is doing is looking for an available GPU worker. Um, if that worker doesn't exist, it's spinning it up. Um, so you have auto scaling, essentially spinning up a worker for us. Um, and it's just starting to process the data right now. Um, with conditional data generation, you start to see some slight differences um, in models and performance. And so, you know, if you're sitting there trying to augment a machine learning data set, this may actually impact the decision of what model you want to run. Um, to summarize, you know, what could be its own session on conditional data generation, um, you know, maybe some simple guidelines that I think about when we're doing something like this or we're working with, uh, with a, a customer on it. The, um, the GAN models that we have, though, so ACT-GAN, CT-GAN um, uh, models that we support, so these uh, generative models that are using something called a generative adversarial network under the hood, um, have advantages in that they work really well with really wide data. So you can have thousands of columns and, um, and generate really good results. Um, however, their conditional data generation isn't as sophisticated as it is with the uh, language model-based system. So with a language model-based system, I could put something in, like I could say, um, you know, to use our, our example we used a second ago, my education level is something that didn't even exist inside the data set, never finished college. You could just kind of make up a new, a new category that didn't even exist in the original data. Um, the language models are built around this use case of, you know, thousands, millions of variations of text. They don't even blink at it. They say, great. I saw college in there somewhere. I'm going to go ahead and complete the rest of the record. So they're a very adaptable and flexible for the different types of data you're sending in. The, uh, the GAN models, um, so using, uh, for example, here we're, we're uh, um, one of the other models we support is, is called ActGAN. Um, they, um, they work by essentially taking every type of category you might have, like a, a high school education um, tag that you had. So like high school um, GED, for example and turning it into a number. So it gets encoded as a number. And what that means is the GANs don't have that level of flexibility to see new types of data and handle it well. So if you're um, training a, a model and you're using it for conditional data generation, GANs will work really well um, on a couple columns that you wanna conditionally generate. Um, and the language model is extremely flexible. So while it's not as fast, you can define as many columns as you want to all the way up to the, to the you know, final column and, and just have it finish the, the data for you um, and be confident it's going to work every time. So a little bit of a balance there. Um, and, you know, one that we're working on all the time is trying to kind of close the gap between our different models as we continue to evolve them. Um, but at the moment, you know, I like to think GANs work really well on high dimensional data. That means like lots of columns, lots of rows. The language models um, work really well when you have, you can have really long data. Um, but especially when you want to have like um, variability inside of that data that's either rare in your original data set, if you're trying to boost a few examples of fraud, for example, then LSTM is you know, the synthetic models are going to be your friend. Um, and um, um, also, um, if you're machine learning accuracy, the, uh, the, the language models work really well for that, too. Awesome. That's yeah. There's a lot so that can, goes into all this. <laughs> it is, it is. And, and, and you know, try to make it simple, it's definitely a goal. So here we can see um, some kind of cool stuff happened with the, uh, the model here. So it trained, uh, the default tells it to train up, I believe to about a hundred epochs of data, but what it found, and this is called early stopping, is that it got really good results and wasn't improving much against the real world data. Um, so it stopped at epoch 37, feeling like it had a really good um, set there. And then the next thing it does is generates as we saw before, like a sample set of data, which we use to evaluate the quality of that data. So it terminated training early because it came to a really good solution and it didn't overfit. And this is really important for people that are looking at a privacy uh, use case that you don't want your, you want your models to learn patterns in the data, but you don't want it to memorize the data. 
So in the case above, it's, it discovered that it had learned the patterns as well as it was going to without like line for line memorizing data and said, great, I'm going to go ahead and terminate training and take the best um, epoch that I had, the best accuracy score and move on and start generating data. And that's what we see happening here. Cool. So question, because like I've always I've always heard that, but I've never quite understood it. That like learning and not memorizing. Why is memorizing bad in a synthetic data model? Yeah, um, we want to build with synthetic data. You want to build on the uh, like the original real world data that that you're training on. Um, you don't want to memorize it. Like there's a reason why you're not using your real world data. Um, e, um, either a like privacy. You know you can't use it for privacy concerns. Um, or b if you're trying to augment. You're trying to take your machine learning data set that maybe works really well on 80% of use cases, but on that final like 10 to 20% isn't doing very well. You don't want to repeat more data from the real world data set to get there. So the idea is you want your synthetic data model to introduce new variations. And those new variations will help that machine learning model respond better to changes in real world data when it comes in. So maybe backing up a, you know, a step here, I think one of the top challenges we see and uh, with, with the users we work with um, and keeping these machine learning models that they built deployed and creating value for their business is, is dealing with data drift. So this idea of like data drift and concept drift. Data drift is when just fundamentally somehow um, the, uh, the inputs to your system are changing. So um, inflation would be an example, right? Where you start seeing like increased um, like costs for things that just are just the results of things changing over time. Concept drift is when all of a sudden people start using your system in a much different way than they ever did before. And the simplest way to, I, I would use to describe concept drift is um, the pandemic, right? Think of how people used Zoom and <laughs> streaming platforms before pandemic and then after. And what this results in is machine learning models only work on the data they've been trained on and they don't generalize very well. So synthetic data is really powerful when you start to see these shifts in, in patterns and usage, whether it's this data drift we talked about or concept drift, um, to take those few examples that you have, generate a ton of new examples that you can use, and then update the training set for your machine learning model. And that helps you keep that model deployed and creating value for you longer. Okay, that makes sense. I really, yeah, awesome. I'm learning too. All right. Cool. It looks like we're still. Yeah, we're still over here. You say we're generating data and comparing for accuracy right now, correct? Yeah. So how did it, I guess while we're waiting on it, how did it, so what did it do? Did it see that the accuracy, oops, the accuracy here is all within like a thousandth of a decimal place? So it decided, hey, we're not really getting any better. Like how does it determine when to basically short circuit and stop? There's some logic um, in there, uh, and it really depends on your configuration that you choose. Uh, but our default configuration is saying if you're not improving or if the accuracy starts to drop, like maybe it did there in the last couple epochs, um, then it's going to say, okay, we've got the best you know, version of our model. Here, let's look at the accuracy and loss and take a look and see if we can figure out what's happening. Yeah, it looks um, like, let me get zoom in as much as I can on that one. Oh, and it keeps scrolling every time a new one <laughs> pops up. So uh, there. So it looks like it was like 0.89. 895, 895, or 889. Oh, I'm going to hold it here. That'll work. There. Yeah, it looks like it was, it might have actually started to drop in 4.6, yeah. 4.7 by a 10,000th of a decimal point, but. But that's enough. So the model will grab that kind of best score that we had around uh, Epoch 30 and use that and then kind of move on to the next step. Okay. Cool. Second thing that we're seeing here is a actually really neat kind of illustration of um, language models versus um, versus the GAN models that we offer, right? So language models, incredible performance, um, incredible accuracy. Um, but like by virtue of how they work, they can't be paralyzed in the same way that a GAN can. So I, I think maybe a fun example to show next is like, you know, using either statistical models or our GAN models, like how fast we can generate data. Um, here, a language model essentially predicts the next token in the sequence. So it's saying um, my high school degree was, um, you know, a GED and my, uh, my age is 24, right? So it's predicting that how old is, how old is my age in this data set. Um, and because of that, you have a level of recursion. So essentially the inputs from the previous thing are required uh, for the inputs next. And anybody in the computer science world knows that uh, recursion is not good for parallelization. <laughs> So, uh, so here we've got this paralyzed and it's running on a lot of separate threads um, on CPU for inference, um, but we can't get those same types of performance, you know, 
explosive performance gains that we can get when we use a, a generative model like a GAN, where everything's just matrices and numbers and they can be very easily um, paralyzed. Cool. So would you say that the, the LSTM model that we're using here, like if you really care about super, super high accuracy, it may be a little bit slower, that's fine. But if we go to a statistical model, which we are totally going to do here in about as soon as this is done, we, we, you, it's a trade-off. You have to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for speed. That's, that's fair. Yeah. And, and scale in some case becomes possible with the um, other types of models. You know, if, if you're working with a data set that's a terabyte in size, billions of records, um, it wouldn't make sense in many cases to train a language model on it. Um, you'd want to use one of the other models that um, could process that data set quickly and, and give you an answer, you know, within an hour instead of waiting for, a, for, a, um, for this to finish. Um, so it is certainly a balance that you try to find. Uh, each one's got different um, benefits, but these language models, you know, here we're referring to the LSTN. We offer, also offer a pre-trained uh, language model um, uh, using a transformer, a GPT-3 type architecture. It's even slower, but uh, both offer like really state-of-the-art performance and accuracy. Awesome. Oh, looks like we're getting there. Number of saving model. Let's go back over here and see. Nope, still going. We're getting there to the end. Uh, generating, yep, yeah, model creation complete. But it still says it's creating the SQS report, so. Oh, no, it finished over here. I was waiting for, so we have an SQS of 95. Woo, we got, mm -hmm. that's, that's getting up there. Um, and now what we can do is we can generate, oh, we're doing the conditional training, so we have to change this. So now what we do to conditional gener conditionally generate is we're going to create a C data frame. Now, you said we could do this in CSV and data frame, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then what all we're going to do is just create a data frame here. And we're going to go with high school grad. We're going to go with never married. And we're going to see greater than 50K. Um, how sensitive to... Um, capitalization and, ca and case is this model. So like if I had put this as a lowercase k, would that have affected anything? Um, you always want to replicate that data as close as you can or the, you know, your mileage may vary. So um, with this particular uh, model using a language model, um, it'll be pretty adaptable to uh, even misspellings or, or uh, new variations that are put in there. Um, but um, definitely recommend here whenever possible is to, to match that as close as you can. Fantastic. And then we set the columns as the seed field. So now we have our data frame and we just say model.generate seed underscore df equals seed underscore df. That's what you get when you name things the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. And now we go ahead and we are now going to sh ship it off. Is there's, can we, is that something, can we view when it does it, when it does conditional, where does that go? Yeah, oh, we should be here. able to see that if you click in the model. Um, that we've picked right off and you, there you go. Yeah. And now we just wait on it here for it to go. And this usually happens pretty quickly. I, I remember, um, but awesome. We've got that. That's some impressive live coding there, Mason. Uh, you know what? It's really easy when you have it on the side, <laughs> <laughs> which I've always Pro done tip. every, every time. Yes. hundred percent. If you ever want to do live coding, have like make yourself notes it's not cheating it's it's it, it, no one wants to see you fumble over over that over misnamed parameters for 25 minutes okay like i've i've seen that before it's not fun and that way even if you have it there if it doesn't work you can copy and paste it there you go there's, there's nothing wrong with giving up at the end okay so we have some data and here we go so we have a high school graduate who is never married uh making greater than 50k and then we have a person who has a bachelor's degree who is never married who is making under 50k so the rest of this data it looks like the race the gender relationship all of these different things were built by the model which is uh pretty yes cool. cool and then if you in if you want to do more uh like say you want like a lot more of these you can just do a little bit of a little bit of python math multiplication here mm -hmm. um to do more but i don't think we need to do that so now we, we, we just got done doing all of that let's go ahead and play with the statistical model now, which is Amplify. Let me, let me clear this out and figure out how I want to approach this. Okay, so we're still going to want this model.generate. We'll come back to that and we'll leave that there. So now, as, as Alex had said earlier, right now we do like 
the trainer does a really good job of picking your model for you. But if you did want to specify your model, you can do it and you have to, you do have to import it. So um, there are docs for this. I'll show those at the end. But from, you know what, we're going to be good Python engineers and we're going to do this up here. Gretel trainer dot models import Gretel amplify. Let's rerun this. Okay, so we're good. So we come down here and now we specify model type Gretel amplify. Um, we're going to change the project name to amplify here in the trainer. And now what we can do is we can specify our model type. So we tell it exactly what to do. Um, and then we just give it our data set and we train the model. We don't, we, I left the seed fields here. You don't need them anymore, but I just didn't delete them. We're not using them anymore. Um, okay, Alex, you want to tell us what's going on underneath the hood here? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're training here, um, not a deep learning model. Uh, this is a statistical model uh, based on, on copulas. Um, and so what this is, I would view this as a state-of-the-art statistical model um, that has a couple advantages um, that make it really great for certain situations. Uh, one, um, it runs on CPU, which is wonderful, right? Like not every um, uh, person, for example, if you're running into this inside your own data center, inside your own VPC or on the, your workstation, right, might have access to GPU to use. Here you can get uh, really great performance. I'd say we see an accuracy drop of about 10 to 15% typically versus our, our deep learning models. Um, from uh, the Amplify model, which can run on your laptop, it can run on like any kind of CPU based instance you have. Um, another thing we've done is we've spent a lot of time here um, building Amplify to be extremely fast. So here you can see the SQS finished already. So uh, both on training, where you can have Amplify trained on data sets that are in the, the gigabytes to terabytes, which um, you know would take quite a bit of time with the deep learning model. We see about a you know a ten point drop in our synthetic quality score versus the original data, but still very good. Um, and then uh, highly optimized, so essentially taking advantage of, of CPUs and threading and instruction sets, but a, a highly optimized ability to generate a lot of data. Um, this came out of some uh, customer discussions that you know we've had, where customers are trying to build large variations. So take, for example, 10,000 example, you know, data points you saw coming into your, your pipeline. How do I create like a billion or 10 billion uh, records that I can use to stress test my infrastructure? So this is where Amplify comes in. It's not just copying the data, it's creating whole new records, different distributions of, of integers, age, ages, things like that. Um, and uh, we can do it uh, really fast. Awesome. Yes. And we did see that it ex like this executed 57 seconds. Okay. If you're like the reason that Alex and I have been talking so much is whenever you do live coding with, with models, you tend to have to fill that space. Um, so we've been kind of filling the space there, but we got this one done, you know, before Alex was done with his, with explaining it. So 57 seconds is pretty good. And then now what we can do is we can set our num records option and let's go ahead and just do, let's make a million records. Let's see how quickly we can make a million records. Let's see if we can crash collab. I love it. <laughs> it crashes. I've crashed it at a billion, but we'll, but I was able to do a million really easily earlier. So um, yeah, while we're, you know, I, you know, I'm not even going to ask a question because I know how quickly this goes and I won't get through the question before it's done. Um, which is really awesome. I'll go, I'll go fast with some things and see what the right are right doing before this is done. So go we right have ahead. done some, uh, like one of the questions is how fast, right? And we have done some performance testing. So uh, if you're running on a pretty powerful workstation, for example, in the cloud, 32 CPUs, for example, it'll generate um, about 100 megabits per second. So incredibly fast um, that you can hit. Um, here using our cloud instances, they have four cores. So they're not quite as fast. Um, but one of the neat things you can do is just parallelize using the, the cloud. So we could fire off if you, you know, wanted to generate 10 million records, you could kick off 10 jobs at the same time, uh, using this model to generate call, um, have them all execute in parallel and, and get your, uh, your work done really fast. Ah, oh, you beat it. You barely beat it. <laughs> By like a half second. <laughs> By like a half second. So yeah, we just generated a million 500. Did I make a? Interesting. Uh, no, you did not make a bug there. That is an artifact of uh, like the uh, speed improvements that we made. So across the threading, uh, essentially behind the hood, the, the different CPU workers are grabbing um, uh, like jobs off a of queue. And then sometimes uh, it, it creates a few more records than you're asking for. Oh, what a lovely little race condition. 
I've never heard of those been sp spoken about in a positive light. Um, <laughs> okay, so I guess I, a question I have here for you about this is: is are there are there instances where you would use the LSTM? Where, where you would where you would use like two in a row? Like, would you would you train data on the LSTM and then maybe generate? you know, conditionally seed that and then use Amplify to make a whole lot more of that conditionally generated data. Can you chain these models together? Not necessarily with trainer, but like as more of a, a hypothetical. Yeah. So, you know, some of the advantages we have with, with language models are especially like pre-trained language models is they can bring in variations that never existed in your input data. So that's a really powerful concept, right? Like what if synthetic data could actually be better than the original data it was trained on? And some things like our transformer models really open the door for you to introduce new variations. So like our transformer model, um, it's, a, uh, it's a derivation of the GPT-3 architecture. So essentially just an open source implementation of GPT-3, but it might be able to introduce new patterns in the data that we see here. So we see like, you know, the, the college degree being bachelor's, some college, right? Like our pre trained model might even introduce something like PhD or things like that that didn't exist in the input data. So one pattern we've seen um, some of our users take is, is taking a data set here, augmenting it with new examples from a pre-trained model or a language model, and then really using Amplify when it comes down to, okay, now I want to generate like billions of these records. So it's neat seeing the kind of pipelines people build, chaining these different models together, but completely optional. And I would say that's a, um, that is a uh, advanced, you know, kind of Jedi level use case that, that uh, people will go after. Ooh, I want to be a Jedi. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Awesome. So what should we play with next? Are we are we good? Do we, is there anything else you want to cover? Um, there's a whole lot more to Trainer that we didn't cover, like which is a lot of the documentation, which you can find uh, at trainer.docs.gretel.ai. Um, I guess we can talk about the model. So we talked today about LSTM and amplify but do you and right now it says ct again i know we've changed it to actgan so when would you use the actgan model over lstm so actgan is uh, a, a model that we're just launching right now and actually uh, kind of funny story we've been running it behind the hood <laughs> behind the scenes for a while that like really uh, kind of dramatically improves on um uh, the original um ct again model that we launched with so what we're looking at is 90 percent reduction in memory requirements uh, which is super exciting um, and uh, and um, actually an increase in the synthetic quality score. So, you know, we see a 5% plus increase um, over the already like really capable uh, GAN-based model that we were using. Um, so it's an evolution of it, um, but a significant change in the sense that with the, this memory reduction can run on much larger data sets, much more varied data sets. So a lot of users that have worked with GANs, and I, I talked about this a little bit before, that the um, all of the different text elements or categorical things with a GAN need to be encoded into um, a, an integer variable. And what that does is that the more types of variations of categorical data you might have, um, dates, people's names, addresses, things like that, um, create more patterns the model has to memorize and, and end up exploding your memory requirements. So the neat stuff about ActGAN is that you can run on a variety of data sets that were, were never possible even with our previous model. Um, and uh, we're seeing really exciting results and, and even better than expected accuracy on it. Fantastic. Oh, that's always better than the alternative, which is it's not working at all. Why is it broken? <laughs> ah, awesome. Well, I do really, I've, I, I've been playing around a lot with Trainer lately. Um, I've really enjoyed it. It definitely is a like breath of fresh air when it comes to simplicity. And I'm a big, I'm a big simplicity person. It kind of reminds me a lot of like, you know, requests is one of the famous Python libraries that kind of just gets the simplicity of you of mm -hmm. creating and doing uh like you know just a human usable api and i feel like trainer is definitely much more human usable um than other apis that i've seen so i've been really happy with it and really enjoyed playing with it i, I kind of want to go for a billion records but i know that last time it took 20 minutes and it crashed collabs so i don't <laughs> i don't i don't necessarily want to go with that um i don't think i ha i don't think i have any other topics uh, is there anything else you want to chat about before we wrap up? Alex? No, maybe just for things to, to, you know, to leave with, we would love any feedback for folks that are using trainer. Um, don't hesitate, pop into our discord, um, ask questions. We've had actually a pretty awesome discussion happening in there recently. Um, um, or hit us at support at gretel.ai if you have any questions. 
Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I, there's a link down below, as you can see in the thing, but dis gretel.ai slash discord will take you into our synthetic data community discord. There's a lot of really fun things happening there. Definitely seeing a lot more people moving in there. A lot of really great, great questions. Um, if you want to know more about time series, we've been getting a lot of questions about our time series model lately, which has been really interesting. Um, I would be remiss if I did not plug Synthesize 2023. So coming up in uh, Febru on February 8th, uh, 2023, we are having uh, our first or the first Synthesize developer conference. We're going to have a lot of really cool speakers there to talk about synth uh, synthetic data in all different types of fields. We're going to have some really cool like um, presentations, keynotes, uh, panels, some maybe some swag giveaways. It's going to be really awesome. We hope that you'll register. It's a free conference. So if you just go to gretel.ai slash Synthesize 2023 or synthesize.gretel.ai, one of them is a 301 redirect. Which one is it? Um, or 302 redirect. Um, you can go ahead and register for free, and we'll definitely be having more information about that going forward. Um, one last thing is if you enjoy this and you want a couple some Gretel swag, you want a couple stickers or something, fill out this link, grtl.ai. That's our bit.ly link, slash workshop dash trainer. With your name and email address, we will email you and get you a redemption code for getting some stickers sent out to you. And I think that's all we have for today. No, no questions have come through, but I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day, Alex. I know that you're really, really busy. So the fact that you could give an hour to, to talk with us about this is really awesome. And I know the community is really going to enjoy watching this uh, video. Awesome. Thanks, Mason. Awesome. Well, you have a great day. I'll see all y'all later.